Hi everybody, welcome to week two. Uh, we're moving right along in our 12 week summer course here. Uh, before I start the lecture today, I just wanna say that I, I'm really happy with most of the responses on both the intro and the questions I posed to you last week on Meyerson's reading. As to the intro, uh, we have a very diverse group. Um, really happy to see that and I think that we're going to do a lot of learning together during this term. So thanks for that. Um, as to the, the Meyerson questions, uh, I'm going to talk about that a little bit on slide number two. So let me get to that. Well, I sat down and I wrote this lecture and the first slide I wrote was this one here and I put this title at the top, the Constitution. And immediately I was struck with fear because I'm not a constitutional scholar. And uh, a lot of people would say that you should be a constitutional scholar before you start talking about the Constitution. But really and truly, the Constitution belongs to all of us, right? And that leads to my, my, my main point here and that is, what does the Constitution symbolize to us, to me, to you? You know, a lot of people attach kind of a, a quasi-religious significance to the Constitution. I think that's fine. Uh, I don't know if that's wrong or right. But um, I think one of the problems with that is that when we view the Constitution in that manner, it prevents us from really um, starting to dig into the text itself and trying to figure out what it means in context, in context of the time and in context to us. Um, I, I had you read those chapters from that Meyerson book last week because I, I found his emphasis on this idea of partial originalism very fascinating. You know, what what does Meyerson mean by partial originalism? And a lot of you talked about that and we bantered back and forth on that. Um, you know, to me, and this is my opinion, the, the constitutional concepts are, are enduring. But what changes is the context of our times. And things that the founders could not have foreseen change. And some of those things change dramatically. And I have an example here that I'm, I'm going to talk about. But, but just for a second, let's, let's get back to the Constitution itself. So what is the key to understanding the Constitution? Well, I borrowed this from a, a person named John Rohr and from Federalist 51. Um, as you note, I included a paper I wrote a few years ago on John Rohr. I included that in the weekly readings. It's not a, an assignment. It's an optional reading. But if you glance at that, it gives you an idea of where Professor Rohr was coming from. He devoted most of his most of his professional career in academia um, as a public administration scholar, uh, talking about the Constitution and its its value to public administration. So, um, if you glance at that paper, you'll see where he's coming from in terms of the Constitution. But but what he says is that the key to the Constitution is is separation of powers, both the separation of powers between the legislative, executive, and judicial, and the separation of powers between national and state, which really concerns us more in this course. So I wanted to give an example of how I felt about both separation of powers and um, Meyerson's idea of partial originalism with reference to an example of the United States military. And all of you know from my introduction that I was in the military as an officer for 26 years, so I do have that bias. But uh, this is also uh, a topic of a lot of my research. Um, and so a lot of what I'm talking about here comes from my research. And in my research of m some military policies, you know, what I found is that over 230 years, not just the technology of the military has changed, but, but the way Americans feel about the military has changed as well. And, you know, a lot of people do have views on the military, and that's fine with me. Some people would say we don't even need a military. And if you can defend that position, 
I'm happy listening to it. Some people say we should, uh, you know, uncritically provide the Department of Defense with all the funding that it asks for. And if you can defend that position, I'm happy to listen to it. Um, my personal opinion is that neither one of those positions can be defended very well. I happen to believe in a role for a military for a democratic society. But be that as it may, one of the things that interests me is that the founders in 1787, when they wrote the Constitution, had a far different view of what a military should look like than we have in 2016 or that we've had since at least the post-World War II era. So post, I say post-1947, and 1947 is when the National Security Act was was signed. The National Security Act created the, the, the Department of Defense. There was no such thing as the Department of Defense before 1947. There was an army and there was a navy. That's what's in the Constitution. The Marine Corps was treated um, sometimes as part of the Navy, mostly as part of the Navy, but sometimes as part of the Army through the 1800s. The Air Force came out of the Army. So what the Constitution set out was an Army and a Navy. And in 1787, there was a very real fear in America of standing armies. And this fear came from the history uh, from Europe. You know, monarchs use standing armies basically to subjugate people in some in their own people. Um, and standing armies were, for the most part, in a in a monarchy, uh, really part of that king's personal power. Um, Parliament had some things to say about the military in. Uh, Britain, for example, but that only evolved. Um, and so there was a very real fear that when the United States formed its own constitution, that, you know, we would be subject to the same things that had happened in Europe, whereby the president would use the army to subjugate people and to exercise tyranny. And so in the Federalist Papers, um, and in the Constitution itself, there were some very important safeguards. You know, um, Wilson, in, I'm sure you read w Woodrow Wilson, but he said that, you know, the Constitution didn't talk about administration. Well, actually, in Article 1, Section 8, there's 18 clauses that say what the Congress has the power to do. Nine of those clauses, nine of those clauses have some something to do with some aspect of of the military, um, whether it's the military or state militias or forts, it, it has something to do with the military. So actually that was on their mind a lot. And it, as I said, it established a separate national Navy and national army, and that it was actually a very purposeful separation of powers. The founders really had different ideas about what the Navy did and what the army did. Hamilton um, in Federalist 11, said that the Navy's job really was protecting the commerce of the new nation, of the United States. It was protecting our ports and our commerce from uh, the British, the Spanish, and the French. Um, that's what the Navy did, protected commerce. Um, there was a separation of powers in the way the military was supposed to operate in the Constitution. And that is to say, um, that the Congress really controlled the rules of the military. That's what it says in Article 1, Section 8. And that the president was the commander-in-chief, but only when the army was actually in the field. Um, and so in Federalist 69, uh, Hamilton talks about the limits of the presidential role. And to quell the fear of the standing army, both Hamilton and Madison said in the Federalist Papers that a national army is actually safer than, than state militias. Some of the anti-Federalists said that our military force should be a collection of state militias, you know, run by governors and state legislatures. And they both said that that would result in a situation where larger states would be able to dominate smaller states. But through all of this, 
um, the very real sense that you get is that their view of the military was that a navy was there to protect commerce and an army was there to provide common defense and that's what they meant by common defense common defense against the uh, colonial powers that would be Fran uh, France to some extent but also mostly Britain and Spain and um, in the never-ending wars against the Native American tribes because unfortunately um, you know Americans never really found the key to um, finding peace with the first settlers here and so that's what the army was for but now let's contrast it to post 1947 and a lot of people the people I, I I mentioned who take an uncritical role of the military seem to assume that a strong military has always been a feature of the United States. It hasn't. Um, it's really a post-World War II phenomena when we had stood up a, a felt relatively large standing force because of the Cold War. Um, and forming the Department of Defense was not without controversy. There was a very real fear that if we nominated a person called a Secretary of Defense that that person controlled all of the military power of the United States and could actually launch a coup. Um, but we've also changed some other things. We've actually grown towards more centralization of the military, not less. We've enhanced the powers of the president. You notice um, constantly during a presidential year there's so much emphasis on calling the president the commander-in-chief. That wasn't on the mind of of the founders constantly referring to the president as the commander-in-chief but we have somehow been able to maintain uh, the role of civ civilian control of the military but now would you say that after I just went over that briefly would you say that our current military is unconstitutional I mean I would not make that claim but I would make the claim that if we could somehow bring Hamilton and Madison back to life in 2016 and let them observe the military that we have today they would be a little bit taken aback but they'd probably also be taken aback by how circumstances have changed for you know the little country that they helped found so um, I think this is a great example of how this idea of partial originalism applies how the context of the times has allowed us to use the concepts of the Constitution, um, namely the separation of powers between Congress and the President, um, and civilian control of the military, and it's allowed us to have a military that really has never been a threat of, you know, of becoming a dictatorial military or a coup-like military in the United States because of the Constitution. So that's just my little example. You probably have more. So let's move on from there, because I'm taking up a lot of time with you here. Okay, so let me, the constitutional chronology, and I get this um, mostly from this source, Kerry and McClellan, and uh, what they do is they, they uh, include all the Federalist Papers, and they also have a little introduction. So the rest of this lecture is from their introduction on the Federalist Papers. So just some facts about the Constitution. We know that the United States Constitution is the oldest written national constitution still in force. Um, and I think we all have a general sense that the Constitution was written um, because the founders thought the, the Articles of Confederation was a weak document. And so Kerry and McClellan point to three reasons for the Constitutional Convention. They say they wanted to, the founders wanted to improve the relationship among the states to form this idea of a more perfect union. They wanted to design a federal system with powers for the states and powers for the national government. And they wanted to implement this principle of government by consent. And, and that part had to do with using a constitutional convention and then in the states using constitutional conventions to approve the constitution itself. So this idea of the Articles of Confederation and Perpetual Union, what Kerry and McClellan say is that it was really more like a treaty between sovereign states than a, gen than a genuine constitution. There was really, there were, really was no executive, there really was no judiciary in the Articles of Confederation, no national executive or judiciary. All the power was vested in Congress. 
the articles required unanimous consent for most actions, which is which is difficult with 13 states. Um, you know, in the Meyerson reading, uh, he talked about this issue of continental army pay. This was actually a direct result of one or two states often not wanting to contribute money for pay, and so therefore the army couldn't be paid. Um, but meanwhile, um, during the revolutionary period, states were uh, experimenting with their own constitution. So the Massachusetts uh, constitution actually predates our, the U.S. constitution, and it was important because it was written in a constitutional convention format in Massachusetts, and that was borrowed for the constitutional convention. Um, but finally, in 1786 and 1787, there was a movement among the elites. And when I say elites in this sense, I'm talking about the people who had been the leaders in the 13 states during the whole revolutionary period um, to have a constitutional convention to supposedly revise the Articles of Confederation. And so when the constitutional convention did meet in those four or five months in the summer of 1787 in Philadelphia, they started out with this thing called the Virginia Plan, which was heavily influenced by Madison. Well, this was a, a large state plan from a large state person, which really called for a, a national government um, with representation by population. And so it really favored the large states. Uh, this was the ma first major stumbling block. Um, through some their first compromise in about June of that year, they came up with this great compromise whereby they created the House of Representatives with proportional representation and the Senate with equal state representation. And so the, what came out of all this was the Constitution with our you know, with our House of Representatives, with our Senate, with the President, and with the Supreme Court and the court system. But lest we forget, you know, I let me go back to this idea that people attach this sort of quasi-religious um, meaning to the Constitution. And when they do that, my contention would be that they're failing to remember, what, you know, what that Constitution looked like in 1787. Um, you know the House of represent the House of Rep Representatives was proportional, but it did include this infamous three fifths clause, whereby uh, you know each person in bondage, each each person who was in slavery and racial slavery was a part of the United States. Each of those persons counted for three fifths of a person. Um, and aside from the fact that you know that's dehumanizing. Um, I, there's there are numerous historians who argue that this is actually beneficial for the for the slaveholding states because they could dominate the House of Representatives. But be that as it may, the House of Representatives really truly was the only body in the constitutional structure that that was elected directly by the voters, by the people. So the voters you know, were qualified at the state level. So however the state qualified voters, and in most cases it was white males, and a lot of cases it was white landowning males, that's who voted for the House of Representatives. That was the only body, though, in the constitutional structure directly elected. The Senate was indirectly elected, and that was by design. That was to maintain the interests of each state as a state. Um, and that changed later with a constitutional amendment, but that was by design. The president was elected indirectly by electors, and the 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 electors uh, were either voters in the states or state legislatures, and that was up to the states. So the president was indirectly elected. The office of vice president is mentioned in Articles One, the legislative article, and Article Two, the presidential article or the executive article. But the only jobs that were really given to the vice president are president of the Senate and and becoming president should the president be unable to serve. The Supreme Court was an indirectly appointed body in that um, the 
The federal judiciary is appointed by the president with the advice and consent of the Senate. I think we all know that. There wasn't a Bill of Rights yet in the Constitution, and the federal government had weak taxation rights with the assumption that most mostly the states did the taxing. So my point of this slide is just to say that when when people sort of attach this this uh, nostalgic religious affiliate, uh, you know, religious feel to the Constitution, I mean, they need to remember that um, what they think the Constitution said maybe isn't what it said. So it, from the Kerry and McClellan text, I, I get the rest of this outline of the Federalist Papers. I gave you three Federalist Papers to read, but what were the Federalist Papers? So just by way of review, most of you know this. You know that uh, the provision was made in the Constitutional Convention that once nine states approved or ratified the Constitution, then it would go into effect. However, um, there were two important states that m most everyone knew without their support, the, the Union would probably fall apart, and that was Virginia and New York. Um, nine states had already ratified the Constitution before New York and Virginia had, and there was quite a bit of resistance to ratification in New York. And so the Federalist Papers really were a series of pamphlets written uh, in late 1787 and 1788 and published in newspapers, mostly written by Hamilton and by Madison and by John Jay, which really were advocacy pieces to convince the people at the Constitutional Convention in New York that the Constitution should be ratified. There were also anti-Federalist papers. There were people very strongly opposed to um, <clears throat> the Constitution ratification, and a lot of the Federalist papers answer the, the anti-Federalists. So there's four parts to the Federalist papers. The first part is when Madison and Hamilton talk about the advantages of a more perfect union. And you can see these here. But one of the things that's stressed a lot is this idea that um, in, in terms of national defense, there would be only a national army supplemented by state militias. The, the military would not be a series of state militias. There would be national tax opportunities. You see, I put that last. And so what they were looking for was the opportunity for the national government to tax imports in, in the form of duties and tariffs. And, and really and truly, the tax structure prior to the implementation of federal income tax in the early 1900s really consisted mostly of duties and tariffs. That was, uh, that was pretty much the, the structure of national taxes. The states had taxes that they levied on people directly, but pretty much for the first 130 years of the nation's existence, the national government did not directly tax people. It, tra it taxed uh, commodities and imports. And you can see I have some other points here, and but the point is that the national government would be stronger. So they spent some time talking about the weaknesses of the existing confederation, and really the weakness that they found with the existing confederation, uh, they were several, but, but the big one was that for the Continental Congress to do anything in terms of a law, it had to have unanimous consent of all 13 states. And that was pretty much a non-starter uh, for most of the period of the, the Continental Congress of the revolutionary government, if you will. Um, and that did result in things like the army not being paid for several years during a revolutionary war. Um, the national government was completely unable to compel compliance by the states. So for example, when uh, the revolution was still going on, um, the army was rounded out by quotas. Uh, the Continental Congress would lay quotas on each state for members of the army, but the states didn't have to comply. Um, and 
the the what was lacking in the federal what was lacking in the existing confederation was this sense of clearly defined portfolios between the states and the national government and so the third part of the federalist papers leads to this idea of what okay so what should the powers assigned to the national government be um so what they argue about is that the the whatever powers we give to the national government should be without reservation they should be clearly defined and this is in fact where we get this idea that um you know we have a united states army and a, a united states navy um and not a navy of virginia or you know an army of new york because there was a national army um and so what Hamilton and Madison argue about is that, in fact, giving the national government certain specified powers actually strengthens the state's powers because it removes the states from having to do things that they really might only do weekly. For example, um, states could easily levy duties and tariffs um, on imports. In fact, they did. But if they did it unevenly, uh, it would result in uh, a situation where importers would would favor one state over another and so the idea of those kinds of taxes was that nationally um, it would actually benefit commerce across the nation to have states not compete in that way with each other in terms of taxing imports so part four um, and this is where they actually get into the structure of the government itself. Um, so what what this part of the Federalist Papers is about is probably the part that has caused us the most uh, consternation over time, right? What is the necessary and proper clause? What does it mean when the national government can do everything that's necessary and proper? Um, you know, what does it mean to separate power between the states and the national government. Why is it necessary and proper for the national government to do something that might impinge on the authority of the state? But the, but this is also the part where they where Hamilton and Madison talk a lot about separation of powers and that in fact um, the separation of powers actually makes the union work. So, for example, um, in the military, you know, the president as commander in chief, in their idea, was only when the army was actually deployed, if you will. Um, you know, the president didn't own the army in in the Constitution. The Congress actually owned the army, but the president commanded it when it was when it was actually deployed. Um, and so, separation of powers prevents tyranny by one branch. And so this was the outline of the Federalist Papers and, and where these guys were going with them. So all leading all up to this in my 28 minutes of ranting, and I apologize, um, for this week's discussion board, I actually give you three um, Federalist Papers to read. And I want you to pick one. And I want you to talk about them using this idea of the 3 two, one format. Um, I actually give you where I, uh, where I got this three, two, one format. I give you that in the syllabus tab, but here's what I want you to write. I want you to pick one of these papers. I want you to discuss the author's three main points, what you think they are. Then I want you to discuss two aspects that you don't have a full understanding of, or you have a difficult understanding. And then I want you to, if you could suggest a one question for Hamilton or Madison, um, I'd like you to pose that question. And so this week, I'm going to ask you to respond to each other. You might, you might respond to each other by doing something like, um, you know, answering the question because you think you have the answer or maybe explaining, you know, why you didn't have a difficult time with the two, um, the, the two aspects that your classmates describe. So I will ask for a response this week, but that's the assignment for week two. Uh, and the last thing I want to remind you of is that uh, 
Um, your term project proposal is due. It's coming up June 4th. A couple of you have asked me questions on the term project and I welcome those. Uh, I'd like to see questions if you have them. Um, otherwise, um, please turn that in by June 4th and that'll be um, at the end of week three. So that's my lecture for this week. Uh, happy reading and I look forward to your comments. Thank you.